My guest today started in the early 80s in Twickenham when the singer, a former chorister, saw a review in the local paper of a band that sounded similar to his own blues rock outfit. He went to their gig with the intention of poaching their drummer, but he instead he met the man who would become his songwriting partner and his bandmate. They officially became a band in 1982, and after recording a demo of two of their tracks, they signed a record deal with Chrysalis. Their debut single, We Close Our Eyes, was released in February 1985 and reached number five, helped by a very MTV-friendly video that was directed by the legendary Godley and Cream. The following year, they won Best British Breakthrough Act at the Brit Awards. Their eponymous debut album was released in April 85 and reached number eight in the charts. In 1990, they agreed to allow their single, King of Wishful Thinking, to be used in a little film at the time was known as $3,000, but later became known as the global phenomenon that is Pretty Woman. The track was a worldwide hit. At the 1991 Brit Awards, the song was nominated for British Video of the Year and also won them the Most Played Video of the Year Award. Two years later, they won the same award for their song Faithful. They had a brief hiatus in the 90s before reforming in 2000, and since then, they've released another two albums and perform live extensively with additional outstanding solo projects and solo albums, solo tours. They'll be joining us on the Saturday at Forever Young. And I can't believe I'm introducing one of my heroes, ladies and gentlemen, the lovely Mr. Peter Cox from Go West. Hello there. Hi, Peter. Um, lovely to see you. Um, I'm a huge fan of the band and your solo work. Um, you'll often have seen me at the front at Rewind and waving Go West banners and uh, Peter Cox, you're so hot signs. Uh, so I have to say, I'm probably having a little bit of a having a little bit of a flush here. But um, we, you know, you joined us at Winterfest in our first Winter Festival in 2019, and you're back this year for Forever Young in July. Um, if it's okay with you, I've got some questions that have been uh, posed by our audience. Absolutely, of course. Super. Okay. So, from me, um, before Here and Now, Rewind, Forever Young and the huge live resurgence of the 80s scene, there was Reborn in the USA and I absolutely loved it. Was it as much fun taking part in it as it looked? And were the on-show antics and frictions just for show, or was it as contentious as it was portrayed? Okay, I'll try and keep this answer reasonably short. <laughs> um, the prospect of being involved in the show for me was a, an absolute nightmare. In the run-up, I was seeing huge pictures, posters in London of Tony Hadley, for example, who's a friend of mine, and I was caught between thinking, well, that, that's that looks great for Tony, and I'm so glad I'm not going to be on that show. <laughs> but uh, as events transpired, Mark Shaw uh, had to leave the show. We'll leave that story <laughs> alone. And uh, I think the fact that I had a green card because I was a temporary US resident was really the main reason why I got the opportunity to join the show because um, obviously it was an easy fix and they needed someone really quickly and there was no visa issue for me. But I was absolutely terrified by the prospect. But as the weeks went on, yes, it did become more enjoyable. And even though I'd lived in America for quite some time, I'd never been to Cleveland or Nashville or Memphis or any of the cities that we visited on the show, fantastic music cities. So that part of it was really enjoyable. And oddly, because um, the production company were very keen for the artist and the TV crew to be very separate. Uh, when I first got to uh, New Orleans on the very first show I was involved in, I tried to stand behind the crew because I was so camera shy. And they said, no, 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 you've got to go over there with the artist. So uh, it quickly became, something of an us and them kind of thing. We, the artists, and those guys. Uh, so when you ask about the friction and the contention, um, I think we as artists felt really quite a, a team spirit, really. Everyone was rooting for everyone else, to an extent. Of course, everyone would like to win the show. But um, the TV production company did 
go out of their way to generate friction because that in their eyes would make the show more interesting for the audience and since you were kind enough to watch maybe you'll I don't know if you agree if it was fun to watch um poor Therese having a nightmare and Sonia and all that friction that was going on there was to some extent organized by the tv people to make things look more contentious yeah. than they actually were uh, in the spirit of the show yeah, I think I mean I think car crash TV sadly is a phenomenon that that you know puts bums on seats where for you know uh, for the TV companies it's not always the nicest thing um, to to be involved in or to watch but uh, you know and and especially in my generation no. we're all very fond of all the artists and you know it wasn't always pleasant to see some of the things that happen um, but it certainly created a you know a buzz around you and I I mean I've only ever found it on a CD as a, a you know as songs from Reborn I've never found it as a um, as anything on YouTube or re-released. I mean, I think they're missing a trick there because it's got a bit of a cult following. So it'd be great to, to go back and review it. OK, did you ever believe in those early days that Go West would still be going strong in these, you know, now in this day and age? No, had you said to me in 1985, you know, you'll still be making a fool of yourself on stages uh, 35 years from now. I'd have said I thought that was kind of unlikely, but here we are. Fabulous. And so glad you are. Um, right. Edel has asked us a question. Um, your friendship goes back a long way. What other jobs were you doing when, uh, you know, at the, in the early days and before the start of Go West? Uh, I think my last day job was uh, working in a department store. I definitely did a, st a spell in that department store, working as the car park attendant. Very glamorous. Um but by the time Richard and I started to hang out together and the very beginnings of our songwriting collaboration, I was already working in residency for a company called Mecca uh, in the UK. And I was working at their, uh, at their nightclub in Sheffield singing three nights a week, uh, as Richard's fond of saying, three times a lady, four nights a week or something to that effect. Anyway, and Richard was working... Um, for a free sheet advertising newspaper, the kind of thing that would get posted through your letterbox with various local companies advertising. So uh, yeah, every couple of weeks or so, he would get on the motorway in his company car and drive up to Sheffield with all the videos and records that he had amassed in the interim in the previous two weeks. And we would uh, sit there, you know, drinking cheap wine and, um, and assimilating influences, I suppose. Richard uh, reintroduced me to what was contemporary Motown at that time, because my teen years, Motown was kind of the soundtrack to that era, would have been late 60s, I suppose. Um, and so Richard introduced me to the Doobie Brothers and Steely Dan and this West Coast kind of sound, which was definitely an influence on our songwriting at the beginning before our friend Gary Stevenson got involved. Gary's influences were very different. <laughs> I often say about Gary that he went from um, Thin Lizzy to Trevor Horn in one big step, <laughs> missing out anything to do with R&B altogether. Everything in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, well, that, that actually, it's, it's interesting. I worked in a I worked in a broadsheet advertising sales in around the same time, 87, 80, 86, 87 in, in Sutton and surrounding areas. So Richard and I's past may have crossed, who knows? Well, I think he was out of it by then. But as you say, very similar locals, yes. Your record label had you living together for part of the time. Uh, do you think that contributed to your obviously strong friendship and the longevity of your partnership? Uh, well, we ended up, uh, after some years in the wilderness, after the, the lack of success of our second album, um, we ended up living together in Los Angeles, writing the songs for what became our Indian Summer album, uh, all on the record company ticket, which, of course, we eventually, was eventually added to our enormous debt to the label, which remains to this day in the millions, I'm sure. Um, it was a very comfortable house. Uh, and it was great to live off Laurel Canyon. I don't know how many of uh, our viewers will be familiar with that part of California, but it was great. But I have to say that 
I'm, I'm pretty sure that if Richard were here, he would agree that living together might not necessarily have been the very best idea. And, and uh, we didn't work as hard, certainly, as we probably should have done. Took forever to write the songs for Indian Summer. Uh, so I, I think actually, because I think we lived together for a year and a half um, in that time, and I think it took a certain toll, actually, on our relationship because... Uh, you know, we have been writing songs, recording, touring, um, making records, uh, doing the promo, living in each other's pockets effectively for quite some time. And, uh, you know, that can take its toll on any friendship, really. Too much of a good thing. So, Roisin has asked... I'd love to know what it was like working on your first video with Godly and Cream. Uh, exciting... I was very anxious. They're obviously very smart guys, which had led to um, their success and how hot they were as video directors. And they were very clever in the sense that they knew that neither Richard nor I had any in front of camera experience. Um, so on the day uh, of the video shoot, which was January 1985, maybe, um, I guess it would have been 1985. That's the year the album came out. It was a freezing cold day in North London, uh, a snow outside. And uh, the the shoot of the studio doors opened to the street. So obviously while they were closed, it was relatively comfortable in front of the camera. Um, and when I arrived, I saw the wrench, the, the famous wrench that anyone's seen that we close our eyes video will know about. And I didn't have any idea what they wanted me to do with it. Um, but uh, as I say, they're very clever guys. And the opening shoot, I stood in front of the camera, six feet from the lens. Godly and Cream were either side of the camera, out of sight, obviously. And they just kind of shouted instructions at me while I lip synced the song. So, you know, put the wrench up in the air, hold it over here, use it as a microphone. And so, um, yeah, by by terror or fear <laughs> or bullying, call it what you want. They kind of got some kind of a performance out of me. Um, and the wench was very heavy. So and I was kind of tall, but a bit spindly, no muscles to speak of really. So throwing that thing around, you know, pumped me up as much as my little muscles would allow. Um, and uh, after a, a period of time, I, I, I couldn't, I had to take a break. The, the wrench was heavy. I was out of breath. Um, and then they would get Golden Boy in to do his part of the video. And, of course, he was in the suit looking all cool. And they opened the doors to the street. And I'm in a vest, sweating. And then suddenly it's freezing cold in there. So I would say, you know, uh, over the course of the next 10, 12 hours, that was a really long, hard day's work. It was a, it was a, a baptism of fire. But as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, with very little to do with Richard or myself, um, it was a very MTV friendly uh, video. And we had no presence in the US at that time. The album had probably not even been released at that point. Um, but because MTV was in its infancy there, we got a lot of MTV play. And so it raised our profile or created a profile for us in the US, which we hadn't had before. So even though it was a very expensive video, uh, it, it was good value for money. Did its job, did its job. And that, that moves us on to the next question exactly. from, from JT Moonmin. Um, and you've made some great videos. Do you have a favourite of your videos and why? It's, uh, it's an odd thing to do, making a pop video. I mean, I've got a soft spot for several of them um, in hindsight when I forget what the actual day was like and how hard work it was. And a lot of standing about, that's, that's another thing that happens at videos, waiting, waiting, waiting. But even though you might argue that it was more of a performance video, I quite like the video for Faithful, um, which was one of the lower budget videos we made. Um, but I like the lighting. I like the, the fact that it's performance and it looks kind of real um and i don't mind the way i look in it which is uh which is unusual uh because often you see yourself on camera and you think oh goodness <laughs> me but uh yeah I, I i quite like that i mean obviously 
the King of Wishful Thinking video is a fun video to do. Um, and uh, But uh, yeah, as I say, I'll, I'll pick Faithful, though I do have a soft spot for several of the videos we made. Yeah, no, they're, they're great videos. And you always look fabulous, Peter. I don't know what you're worried about. Um, so staying on the, the video topic, uh, Stephanie has asked, Hi guys, I live in the States and came over for Forever Young last year. It was absolutely brilliant. I was wondering if you'd seen the Jimmy Fallon, Paul Rudd remake of the King of Wishful Thinking video and whether you had found it funny and even flattering. Absolutely, of course, of course, flattered. Uh, I think as I, my manager was very keen for me to try and make Jimmy Fallon my best friend. And <laughs> I, I think, more realistically realised that that was never going to happen. But I did respond, you know, briefly to say to them that a lot of love had gone into that recreation of that video because clearly, you know, they went to huge lengths to, to, as you say, do it shot for shot, make it look almost identically the same. A lot of hard work, you know. So, yeah, hugely flattering and... Uh, and uh, and I would point out that they had two days to make their version, whereas we had to do ours in one day. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, goodness knows what the budget must have been for that recreation. But yeah, obviously great for us, loads of views, loads of, you know, reminding people of the song many years later can only be a good thing. Absolutely. And it shows, shows your importance and your status in the industry, Peter. I've got two questions from Fat, from Fran. Hi guys, my name's Fran and I was just wondering, unlike many of your peers, you didn't have any connection to the punk scene or the new romantic scene and you were far more influenced by American music. Do you think this made it harder for you to find your niche? That's an interesting question. You're right, certainly. Um, when Richard and I began our songwriting was towards the tail end of the punk revolution in the UK, which I'll just speak for myself, it didn't speak to me at all um, because... As you point out, you know, I was listening to West Coast music where musicality and an art, uh, musical skill, if you will, was was kind of the focus. Whereas the punk thing was, if I can generalise, to some extent, it was, look, anyone can do this, you know. And so that's why it didn't really, uh, didn't really speak to me personally. And as you say, no, we weren't a part of the new romantic movement either. In fact, I would say now with the benefit of hindsight, that not really having a strong image of any kind definitely worked against us um, over the course of the next several years, in fact. And often I would uh, I would hear people saying that they, would, they wouldn't know the name of the band necessarily. They certainly would have no idea what we looked like. But if they heard um, We Close Our Eyes or Call Me or The King Wish Were Thinking, they would recognise the song, but they weren't making a connection between the music and any kind of a visual image. So uh, as determined as we were, idiots, <laughs> to, to make it about the music, which I know from a journalistic point of view is about the most boring thing you can say. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's where we were coming from. We wanted it to be about the music. And so when we realized in our naivety after the fact when the first girl west album came out and i suppose in connection with what i was just saying the record label were determined to sell us visually in some way as best they could uh and the pop magazines of the day smash hits number one those kinds of publications um we were we found ourselves at photo shoots for these magazines being uh, having mascara applied for the first time ever and having no idea whether that looked any good or not and just <laughs> being really out of our depths. So after uh, the promotional uh, process for the first Go West album, when we set about making Dancing on the Couch, which was our second album, again, reverting to type and trying to make it about the music, to some extent at least, we were trying to emulate the artists that we had passion for, Steely Dan, the Doobie Brothers, these kinds of artists. So obviously that's reflected in uh, the fact that Randy Brecker came and played flugelhorn on our album. We had any number of session musicians um, for Dancing on the Couch. Uh, and we ill-advisedly um, chose a song called The King Is Dead, which is, had a certain jazzy feel about it. It was a ballad, certainly not your archetypal pop single. And I remember 
going on one of the TV shows uh, of which Pat Sharp was the host. I know Pat, uh, we haven't had this conversation, but I remember playing the video for The King is Dead, which I think was probably live performance at Hammersmith. And when it was over, Pat pretended that he was asleep because that's how that's how good he thought that choice of single was. But, you know, the label had said to us, we don't know what to do with this album. Which song do you want to put forward uh, to, to showcase it, to, to let people know where you're coming from? So we chose, arguably, the least commercial song on the album. Um, and that's why you shouldn't let artists choose their own <laughs> singles, I suppose. It's funny, Fran must have read your mind because her second question was, you worked with Kate Bush on The King Is Dead. Um, how did it come about? Um, would you like to see that song now take off on the back of her Stranger Things resurgence? Well, I think uh, our song taking off on the on the coattails of Kate's success with Stranger Things is, is I think that's most unlikely to happen. Uh, but the way that came about was that uh, uh, the late and much loved Alan Murphy had been the guitarist in Kate's band for some years, and Alan was in the studio with us working on um, the Dancing on the Couch album, and we were working on The King Is Dead. And Richard said something like, well, you know, we, we what we need here, let's be great if we had a backing vocal part that was like something Kate Bush would do. And Alan, because he obviously knew Kate very well, said, well, why don't we just ask her? <laughs> Which is a... would never have occurred to me. So Al got on the phone, spoke to Kate, and she very kindly and graciously said, of course, she would work on the track, but... Um, she wasn't in the habit of getting on an aircraft in those days. I don't know. I don't know Kate really very well. So, but I know that she didn't really much care for air travel. So we bundled up a, a two inch master tape and sent it off. Uh, and she did her thing without any input or supervision from us. And when we got the tape back in it wrapped in its foil wrapper, because of course, in those days, well, still, that kind of thing has to go to an X-ray machine. So we we got our two-inch master, took the foil off, put it on the machine, and there it was. And it was, you know, obviously just such an exciting thing. I'm so grateful to her for agreeing to be involved in it. And she did such an amazing job be doing that thing that only she could possibly do. Mm. And it was a huge addition to the track, yeah. Fabulous, fabulous. Cormac has asked... Before being signed to Chrysler's Records, you did the old-fashioned thing of hawking your demo tape around the different record companies. Do you think in today's climate you would have found it easier by putting your music straight onto Spotify? Uh, I Again, an interesting question. I don't know if either way is really the best. I mean, I think I, I feel for young artists today uh, because as we all know, the, the landscape in the industry has changed completely. It's unrecognisable from those days when, when you sold records, you actually sold records and there was some chance of making some money. But in this day and age where, let me give you an example. Gary Stevenson, um, who's a friend of mine, he produced the first Go West record. I've been working with him recently on my forthcoming solo album. And he, in over the years, has... Uh, developed artists himself and uh, mo his most recent uh, project was a three girl group uh, and he had put time and energy into writing songs, recording, did a photo pack, did a video pack. And when he went about approaching labels to try and get this artist signed, the only thing that the labels were interested in was how many TikTok followers have they got. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you're a young artist now, uh, where we would have lent on the label for tour support, for example, if we were going out on the road to promote our album. And so that was the way that things would have been uh, in the 80s. Now, anyone can make a record in their bedroom with a laptop and a keyboard, a guitar, you know, uh, and labels, if even if the, if the prospect of being signed to a label is even a possibility, you have to be fully formed. You have to do all the work yourself. You have to have a, a social media presence. You have to have 200,000 TikTok followers. You have to be making content for social media, which you can only do yourself 
all day long, every day. There's no way that um, an artist of my era has got those kind of skills or that kind of energy, you know, to, to, I just really feel for young artists trying to break through because you really have to do it now yourself mm. more than ever before. It's mm. all about, you know, you're taking a finished article in effect to a label and saying, here's the thing. I've already got the audience for you. Will you put it out? Yeah. Um, and uh, as an illustration, um, there's a fantastic singer, Donna Missile. I talk about her often in interviews because she's a contemporary artist that I think has got an incredible voice. She could do anything. I mean, this is this woman's not messing around. She's got a fantastic voice. She looks great, um, very strong image. So she, in, in one sense, she's got, she's the full package. She's got great song, she's a great singer, and she looks fantastic. Last year, she got dropped by her label, Universal, incomprehensible to me, an artist like that, and Universal couldn't get her away, apparently, or didn't know what to do with her. But more recently, in the way of younger artists, because Donna Missile is in her late 20s, so she's not 18, but um, she was saying that when she started, <laughs> only 10 years ago, like me, when I started, you know, you have this idea that you're going to write songs and perform them in front of audiences. And that's kind of as far as the job goes. Well, not anymore. And so she found herself required, expected to make uh, TikTok content, you know, all, all day, every Baby day, day stuff, day stuff, stuff. Mm. And, and yeah, and she, she was kind of, she was embracing it. And I would see her TikTok content, but at the same time, she was saying, I didn't sign up for this, mm -hmm. you know, I, and but even more recently, I've seen another artist who is signed to a label um, and she had a song that she felt was really strong and she wanted the label to release it. And the label said, well, you know, we want you to create a TikTok buzz around the single before we'll put it out. I mean, you know, it's to my mind, it's crazy, but hey, you know, it's modern times. So, <laughs> and I'm too old. I'm too old for that stuff. <laughs> well, um, again, you read my mind by touching on it. Um, you've recorded eleven solo albums in comparison to Go West's five. So you clearly <laughs> enjoy the you clearly enjoy the solo recording process. Uh, what keeps bringing you back to Go West and the band? Well, um, obviously, my friendship with Richard and the fact that, um, in honesty. Uh, we talked about this earlier when you said, did you think you'd still be doing this 30 years later in 1985? And of course I didn't. I would, had no idea that we would still have any kind of a catalogue on which to trade effectively because if an agent is putting Go West forward for a show, that agent can say, you know this artist, they've had these successful records, they had a song on the soundtrack of Pretty Woman, uh, so would you be interested in taking this artist to perform at your venue? And often, thankfully, the answer is yes. Whereas, as a solo artist, Peter Cox, that nobody knows, uh, that same agent would have a much more difficult time selling me into venues. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, where, as I've talked about already in the interview, record sales are minimal, you know, it practically com comparatively non-existent to the golden days of, of selling records. Um, so artists, if they want to make a living, they have to go out and play live. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we can still recreate those songs in a recognisable enough way that artists, that audiences who remember those songs and that era and want to have that retrospective experience can come and see us. And thankfully, people do say, and they're very kind to say so, that it kind of sounds like the record, which is, we take that, I take that as a huge compliment, um, because that's what we're trying to do. And we understand that people want to hear those hit songs. So the short answer to your question is, <laughs> if I want to make a living, then, you know, I, I, as half of Go West, as one of the songwriters that wrote the vast majority of the material that we've recorded, I want to take advantage of that. I want to keep on working and I want to earn enough money to pay for my less successful solo <laughs> projects. <laughs> 
Well, um, leading on to the next thing I wanted to ask. So uh, tell us a bit about your um, brilliant latest album, Sea Glass, which is out on the 12th of May um, and a solo tour to boot. Um, and can you explain why Sea Glass? What's the name come from? You're very kind to mention the album. Um, the lady who has done the artwork for the album, which I really am pleased with, Sally Hurst is her name. And she's done the art for the previous two solo albums I made. And she lives by the sea. And every day on Instagram, she posts pictures, fantastic, gorgeous pictures that she takes of the sea on any given day and the sky and birds and so on and so on. And she does, she draws art in the sand and she posted some pictures of sea glass, which if you're not familiar with the term, is what happens to broken pieces of glass when they're in the sea and the tides and the sand and the rocks smooth off the edges of the sea glass, turning broken pieces of glass into little bits of natural beauty and jewelry really. And I was seeing these pictures on her Instagram account and it occurred to me that the length of time it takes me to write and to knock a song into shape, there was a certain connection between the idea about sea glass and my lengthy writing process. So um, I just thought it, it made sense as an album title. Brilliant. That's fascinating. I have seen her. I, well, I follow your page and I've seen her work on your page and it is stunning. Um, and I love the way you always go, ahem. Um, is your little uh, thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's everyone's got to everyone's got to um, use and make the most of social media Absolutely. in 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 their own individual way. And there are many people who are fantastic at it, much much better than I. But I try to be as naturally myself uh, as I can on social media. And uh, as you probably gathered from the last half hour. <laughs> I'm not that great at, at telling everyone how great I am you know, because <laughs> there's a lot of competition out there and I hear songs and singers and artists every day and think, wow, that's just amazing. But, you know, even I still have a love for and a passion for music. I, I try to be aware of whatever is contemporary that I can relate to at least. And that, of course, feeds into whatever my influences are when I'm writing the next song, um, trying to be aware of what contemporary trends are to some extent without necessarily trying to copy anyone else. No, but I think I agree. And I think next to next to health and, and love, being authentic and true to yourself is the most important thing. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, a valuable point to put across at any time. So our last question um, from Daisy. You had some fantastic collaborations together with Tony Hadley on YouTube, including Addicted to Love and Boys of Summer, and you often tour together. Do you think there's any chance of a reunion at Forever Young Festival, as your voices are terrific together? Well, I think you'd have to have a word with Tony about that, really. Um, I, you know, we're, we're good friends. We have talked about the possibility of touring together again, which didn't come about, unfortunately. But because I've got a new album coming out, I am going to reach out to Tony and just mention that if he ever needs an opening act, <laughs> I'm here and willing and ready to go. So uh, I can't make any promises, but... Uh, Always open to that idea, certainly. Absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll certainly mention it. I think, you know, um, the ones I've seen is Boys of Summer and Addicted to Love. And I, I know they're going back a few years, but your voices work so well together. And I think you're two of the most, you know, recognisable and iconic voices from that era um, and still going strong. Thank and you. And probably at the top of their game now, you know, your voices are, are sublime. So it'd be lovely if we can make it happen. Uh, we'll have a word. But so That's lovely. Thank you for joining us today and giving us your time, even despite the hay fever. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that we're working with you in July. Uh, we can't wait. So, ladies and gentlemen, a huge thank you to the lovely Mr. Peter Cox. Thanks so much, Sharon. We're really looking forward to it. Super. Bye. Bye. We close our eyes. We never lose a game. Imagination never lets us take the pain. We the truth.